My name is Pete Hare. I'm uh, speaking. The title of my talk is From Skinhead to Cop Block How Ideas Changed My Life. And pretty much the thrust of what I want to share with you today is just to be, um, just to realize how important ideas are in shaping one's perception. And then ideas obviously are intangible, so we use language to communicate, so really to emphasize the power of language that we use with others, and also that individuals can change. So if someone today is not on board with the views that you espouse, uh, just know that perhaps if, they're, if they encounter certain ideas, you can dwell on them, they may at some point reach a similar conclusion. And even if they don't, as long as they're not aggressing upon you or somebody else, you know, so be it. And uh, I say that just to preface to uh, the story I want to tell. It's just going to be a little bit of my own journey, and then I just, I'll just wrap it up and hopefully we'll be out of here and I won't bore you guys too much. So uh, um, I guess I'll start when I was in high school. Uh, I was, I ascribe to views that I today would say are pretty divisive. I categorize people based on something beyond their control, based on the amount of melanin in their skin. And that shaded my perception. I had a very divisive us versus them mentality. Um, at one point, I owned a T-shirt, a white T-shirt, with a KKK member with a that was holding a sign that said "White Pride Worldwide." And I felt like, hey, I'm I'm doing my part, like uh, to educate people and say, hey, we need to like each do our own thing. And I found myself visiting websites and reading books that, you know, now I would say were sort of like an echo chamber or a confirmation bias. I just bought into these divisive ideas. And I don't really know why. I wasn't never sort of singled out and picked on because of who I was. I never felt like oppressed. But I just, I just sort of uh, really internalized these ideas. Um, one time in a high school physics class, after the teacher was done talking, I got up and went back to the lab area and then decided, hey, there's this kid in the back back of the row here, and I just walked up behind him and spit on his head because he liked men, and for some reason I found that offensive, and I felt justified, I felt like it was funny, and you know, I had some very like petty in school repercussions for that, but that certainly wasn't like a game changer for me, like, hey, you need, to, you need to look at what you're doing and realize you're hurting folks. Um, some of my friends called me White Power Pete at the time. I thought it was, was neat, and it was, it was all looking back now. It's pretty silly, but I think I sort of just heard some ideas, and I, and I rolled with them at the time. But I wouldn't say that period of my life was, uh, in, in longevity, it wasn't, uh, the duration was not too significant, though I soon found myself shifting my perception to one that was still no less divisive, but this was based on uh, where one happened to be born. Again, another arbitrary characteristic. I was, you know, what you might say is like a, a nationalist. I thought the USA was superior to all these other places, and therefore we're people who happen to be born in the States were superior, and I found this uh, a view, that even though it's no less divisive, and we've seen um, the destruction that it wrought, having these types of views, um, that it was a more palatable view to other folks around me. Uh, for example, you know, I would just read the mainstream newspapers and see gross national products and import exports, and it would be framed in very much a fixed pie mentality. If the USA is losing out, then someone else is gaining. Uh, all, one example, too, is I went to the state fair um, and played some game. One I could select from among the prizes, and I selected a patch that was Calvin from Calvin and Hobbes. You know, Calvin was pissing on the Japanese flag, and I thought, yeah, that's great, you know, but to see this sort of us versus them mentality, like this family friendly state fair thing, was much more of a palatable thing than my previous views, and so I ran with this for a bit. Um, I had a two door car at the time, and I 
painted it red, white, and blue camo and put big flags on it and uh, had a big flag in my room and we had a 9-11 anniversary party and it was, it was, uh, it was pretty silly that way. But when I turned 18, the first tattoo I got was an uh, American flag on my bicep and it said, love it or leave it. And I would find a lot of people would give me props for it and, and it was, you know, I thought, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm looking out for my people and this is, this is the way to do it. Um, and so I guess fast forward a little bit, I uh, then was in college and undergrad and growing up I never said I want to be a police employee growing up, but I found myself in the law enforcement undergrad program and I thought maybe I'd I felt like it was a good fit for me at the time. Um, I did, I organized like uh, meetups and visits to prisons and I brought speakers in from federal outfits. Um, but I started to feel some cracks with this mentality that I had and it mostly it initially came from drug policy. Uh, initially I saw it as a misallocation of resources. I saw that all these people were being what today I would say are kidnapped and caged for victimless acts. And uh, so I, I started to question that. Uh, one summer I did an unpaid internship with the St. Paul Police Department just to get more experience. Um, I'd already done dozens of ride-alongs, like anywhere I travel, I'd contact them ahead of time and just kind of get more experience. But this summer at St. Paul Police uh, was, was eye-opening. Um, for example, back to the drug policy, policy issue one night, I accompanied a number of police employees and they, as they uh, did sting operations and rounded up a dozen people or so for selling substances and consensual interactions and they were brought to the cop shop, the police outfit headquarters and then within a couple hours everyone was back on the street and I remember asking some of the police employees, you know, this doesn't really seem effective, you know, and one of them told me, well, Pete, you can't really think of it that way. And I was like, huh, you know, I don't want to just be another cog in the machine and perpetuate this kind of stuff. Um, also, another a couple of memories from my time as an intern. I, uh, one time we went, I was going with some cops to the downtown area, and I remember them saying, hey, just remember, guys, there's a lot of cameras downtown. And so that was something that in the future I, I thought of because um, I guess we'll get to that in a moment, but, uh, and also one of the first police employees that I rode around with, we went uh, for lunch one day, met a couple other police employees at a subway, and one of them proceeded to tell me about how glad he was I wasn't with the ACLU because he was telling me a story about how just that day he had rolled up on some guy who put something in his mouth. He thought the guy must have swallowed the drugs, so he throws his car in park, the guy lays down, hands out, and obviously had dealings with these predators before, and the police employer proceeds to run up and kick him in the head, and he laughs about this. And so that, to me, wasn't something that boded too well. Um, again, he hadn't hurt anybody. And then another memory from my time as an intern, uh, when I was rolling around with the canine folks, you know, they said how they would sometimes the canine employees would pass around pictures of the bites that their dogs caused on people to show how it tore different types of flesh. So these these were like folks, I mean not everybody might characterize it, there certainly there was a couple you know folks that I had respect for, but um, it's just basically the incentives built into that institution that that incentivize these kind of things. Um, so but back in undergrad for one I found myself one semester, I was a resident advisor, so I was in charge of a, you know, a hall and I was just trying to tell the students what activities were going on and make them you know, acclimated to campus and things. And I found myself one time, we had to go on rounds at night and I heard some partying going on. I, hey, what's going on? These kids are drinking alcohol, they're not supposed to have alcohol. I proceeded to like fill out the forms and write them up. And I remember one kid in particular like saying, hey, I'm going into aviation and this could like really like deny my chances to have this and I was like hey I'm just doing my job and I'm like you know and, and, and I felt like even as uneasy as I was doing it I was like well I signed a contract to be in this role 
And so it's that me having that kind of experience that later, um, later when I um, got more involved with cop block, I kind of could empathize with with that mentality. And uh, uh, but I'll get to that in a second. After so anyway, after this law enforcement stage, I ended up going to grad school for law enforcement as well, and uh, applying at. Seattle, NYPD, and LAPD, and I was going through testing, and I wasn't 100% honest on my polygraph with LA, uh, particularly they brought me in afterwards and said, hey, something was a miss here, was there anything else you want to tell us? And I said, well, yeah, when I was in high school, I did some hallucinogens, and I didn't own up to it initially, and they said, well, that kind of looks shady, kind of questionable, so I was like, all right, and I, like I said, I really did, I wasn't like aspiring to be a police employee since I was a kid, I just thought, once I got into it, I could maybe work my way up, change some policies to, to lessen the misallocation of resources and things. So anyway, I just I decided I contacted NYPD in LA and Seattle and withdrew my applications there. And I was fortunate I got a job lined up in the private sector almost immediately doing like surveillance um, for insurance fraud type things. But before I even went to that job, received an email from the Cato Institute which is a libertarian think tank in DC, some of y'all may know. And I was fortunate to be accepted there as an intern. I had applied to be an intern. Uh, I had, in grad school, gotten involved with a college libertarian group, not a big L political party, like pontificating for candidates, but more ideas based. And I found that environment so intellectually stimulating. I called it mind sex because it was, it was so enjoyable for me to be with this crew and, and really, for the first time, question a lot of the ideas that I just found myself uh, to have been conditioned to, you know, through mainstream media and uh, government schools and things. I really didn't question some of these big picture things before. Um, let's see, and also in high school, I, you know, I, was, I started to, question more of the policies of government actors. I read a book called No More Wacos, which was written by a couple guys who were by no means like radical or anything. They just said, hey, the situation that happened at Waco was was not an anomaly, and this is kind of the way these alpha, these agencies are poised to, to, they need to show that they're doing something, and, and for anybody if, uh, aware of what unfolded in Waco, Texas, and also in Ruby Ridge, Idaho, those, issues, those kind of incidents stood out to me and caused me to really start questioning this, this uh, whole system. Um, so anyway, after, after grad school and after my move to, Cato, to DC, I spent five years in the DC think tank world. I was an intern at Cato, and at the time I was still very much, I would say like a minarchist. I thought, well, we just need like small police corps, military, like pull everyone back and just like, let's, let's like not be offensive, just be defensive. Um, but in DC, I really had my first exposure to economics, I would say. For a long time, I told everybody I never had an econ class in my life, but I guess last year I was looking back through grades and I saw, in fact, I had an econ class in 10th grade or something, and it, they really never, it was really just the sort of GNP, like the big aggregate picture. So in my time in DC, I was exposed to economics really for the first time, and uh, especially Austrian economics, which really resonated with me, which a lot of y'all probably know really focuses on individual actions and it has some really empowering concepts like unintended consequences and creative destruction, uh, spontaneous order, all these things that really caused me to see, hey, let's move away from this top-down approach to the bottom up. And also, that summer, my first summer, this was 2005, I went to DC and uh, that summer I was involved with another program called the Koch Summer Fellow Program, which was run by a group called Institute for Humane Studies that works with college students. And through that, I was an intern at the Drug Policy Alliance. So like some days you may see people like clamor against like the Sor George Soros or the Koch brothers as being evil, anything they touch. But at that time I was, I was a Koch Fellow, so it was partly funded through the Koch Foundation at the Drug Policy Alliance where George Soros is on the, on the board. So to me, I, I really, I think uh, it speaks to the, the 
fact, like, uh, maybe don't always jump on a bandwagon and be like pro or con something, but think about it, like what, what's actually going on. But for me, it was a, it was a great experience. Um, as part of the program, we had speakers come in and talk to us that summer, including a gentleman named Jason Sorens, who had written a paper about the uh, potentiality that could come from liberty-minded people concentrating with each other in a, in a one place that tends to be more freedom-oriented. And so this paper, um, fast forward a few years, it turned into the Free State Project, which encouraged people to move to New Hampshire. So a couple weeks, and they have a festival every summer and every winter, uh, a conference similar to this in the winter, a festival in the summer. And so a couple weeks after hearing Jason Storm speak to us, myself and a couple friends drove up to Pork Fest for the first time. And it was a very eye-opening experience. Um, saw the first people open carrying that I had in my life and had many conversations. And the vibe was much like this, people from all walks of life, sort of just, and definitely not the same idea set, but the overlapping point of like non-aggression I found very appealing. And, uh, also at the first week, as when I was a Coke fellow, we had uh, sort of like a workshops and things, and one of the professors who was there, John Hasdis, who's a teacher's law at Georgetown, he's written a paper called The Obviousness of Anarchy, some of you may know, but anyway, he saw my tattoo, love her, leave it, and by that time, I was not really so like pro-USSA, I was like, I was like, hey, it's about the ideas, it's about liberty, what this means, and he said, well, that's the symbol that these people have, have like bombed, like, defenseless people using and you know that's the, the symbol they go to war under and I'm like you're right so I really wasn't so uh, I couldn't defend any, this ink anymore you know by any stretch of the means um, so after that summer I got hired on at the Institute for Humane Studies again if anyone's in college or knows anyone who is I know college is kind of a sham for a lot of us but uh, I would encourage you to check out the Institute for Humane Studies I think bang for the buck they're pretty effective um, they just are, introduce a lot of college students to the ideas of liberty very effectively, free summer seminars. But um, so I spent the next two and a half years there, and another year in DC at a place called Bureau Crash. And my time there was really uh, informative for me again because I was exposed to a lot of ideas like Bruce Benson, who's, who's written a book called The Enterprise of Law. He's an economist at Tallahassee. Uh, that shows how we got to this like police state based on the incentives um, from the past like 500,000 years ago and so it's very overarching and I think for anybody who cares anything about that issue you should check out Bruce Benson um, but also you know just like Mises and Hayek and, and all these Austrians and like Rothbard I found like compelling but even more so uh, Carl Wagner who's been since the early 80s putting out a newsletter called The Voluntarist. I know in Jeff's opening speech, for anyone who caught it, he said this movement's kind of been like 10 years or so or less, but I would beg to differ. This is like the ideas of, of liberty and complete liberty of, are things that humanity have been like striving for since, you know, there's anything written. And, um, you know, and before Wagner, obviously, there was, uh, there was a French economist, Gustave de Molinari, y'all may know, who in a paper, production of security advocated for voluntary interactions for all goods and services 150 years ago and before that 400 years ago the levelers in England um, you know in a paper called uh, an arrow against tyrants and tyranny uh, advocated said like I, I they said essentially said I own myself and and uh, I have no right to like infringe on other people's ownerships of themselves so ideas these ideas and before that many other thinkers and and folks and um, which and these ideas I mean more than guns certainly that's good to have a defensive tool as, but the ideas are what threatens the legitimacy of, of these regimes that have that engage in democide or the systematic killing of, of people and um, so it's, it's why I think it's important to uh, be aware of them and I'll, I guess another experience I'll mention in my time in DC I'm very into heavy metal and I don't know if anyone else in here is but uh, so after learning about like more Austrian concepts you know I've gone to metal shows for years I found myself in a metal, metal in a mosh pit you know it's kind of chaotic from the outside but it really to me like exemplified what what this is about like 
nice. You might meet someone who are like, you're going to where? Anar Pogo? Anarchy? Like, and they think it's scary, and the idea of being around hundreds of other people who are self-described or at least have affinity for those, that idea might be scary to them, but, um, but again, that speaks to the, the power of language, because like, what does anarchy mean? We might describe it as without rulers or no masters, but to me, it's, that's, it's like, uh, it's, and like, and no government, but to me, there is, that's incorrect. It means anarchists believe in government, they believe in self-government, they believe in like personal responsibility coupled with freedom to act. And so, in these mosh pits, it's like we, no one signed a contract, this kind of behavior is agreeable or not. People just know how to treat each other. Someone falls down, people pick them up to make sure they don't get hurt, you know? And there's an acceptable level of like, kind of what's, what goes on in there. If it's like someone's too aggressive, people are like, hey, you need to chill out, man. And if they don't, they're, they're out, you know? So, uh, we see this all around us. So people who say anarchy, pogo, anarchy, and that's impossible, like, you ask them, like, you live in anarchy, like, 99.9% of the day, almost no one thinks they have the right to initiate force against you, except maybe someone who has a badge, or, you know, these, so, after, I, after some time in D.C., I decided to, I found some people around me seem more interested in talking, what I saw is talking about liberty, or where the next happy hour is, versus, like, living liberty, and, so I quit my job, my friend Jason Talley and I split the cost of an RV and moved to New Hampshire. Uh, that was our home base, to Keene, New Hampshire. And uh, we did a project called the Motor Home Diaries and we were on the road for seven months and did a lot of meetups and things. And through these, through that project and a subsequent projects, Liberty on Tour, uh, I really saw the, the value of connecting with people and just like how these ideas resonate with, I think, everyone at the tour intrinsically. And, uh, but also too that if you say freedom or liberty to anyone, like most people are like, sure, it's a good thing, I, I like it, I want it, but it's so vague. And not too surprisingly in the USSA, anytime you're on the road for a lot of time or you're filming things, police are gonna come harass you or try to do whatever. So we had some police interactions and it wasn't anything we sought out. Our intention was to like spread the ideas of liberty and, and focus and give people a spotlight who are doing things in their areas. But we had these police interactions and these were the types of content that gained traction that we saw people that resonated. And uh, so Adamo Freeman, uh, Adam Miller, uh, he, he uh, start, in between projects started Cop Lock. I joined him there shortly after. Soon we had a small group of contributors and that was, became our main focus for the next number of years, just uh, this police accountability issue. But again, I'll, to speak to the power of language, I think, uh, I would hope most of you would agree that police accountability is an oxymoron because how can you have accountability for these police, this outfit that itself is based on coercion that says we have a right to take money from everyone in this area to then protect them. But then they say they have no duty to protect you. So you can, if you have like a, a poisonous, toxic seed, you can't create something good out of it. So, there, so police accountability is an oxymoron. And just like every other good or service, it should be protection or privacy should be engaged, or protection or safety should be engaged in through consensual interactions, not through, not through a, a monopoly. And uh, so anyway, Adam and I hit the road with the cop lock. We did a number of tours, meetups made some foundational resources and again like because I was went into policing I know like I could have been a police employee and a lot of people would get involved with cop lock which now has grown quite significantly and you know they'd be like fuck the police and I'm like hey like I can understand why you might have that mentality if you've been preyed on your whole life but at the end of the day that's not productive like that should build a wall and create an us versus them so I think more constructive is to try to share resources with police employees say hey this is we have a similar end goal. We want to have live in a safe community. Well, maybe there's a better means to get there. And so, uh, y'all may know of Dale Brown's Threat Management Center. Perhaps that model is more uh, aligned with uh, a direction we could go together. Um, but after after quite a while with involved with that sort of a message and putting a lot of resources and 
my own time, I started to feel a little burnt out. I felt like I was trying to save everyone. But it was one reason that I really focused on trying to build groups with Cop Lock and, and not just Cop Lock, Cop Watch, Peace of Streets, folks that have been doing stuff for years um, so that people local could help each other. That's really what it, you can't, one person can't save everybody. And uh, so I felt like I had said what I need to say, like to inject a, more of a complete liberty message into that conversation. And uh, I think Rosewater Lane maybe had a quote about leaving signposts. So like you should always essentially invest in yourself and keep moving forward. And if you've done something that other people think is worthwhile or that they can maybe glean some info from, that they can like see that signpost that you've done and like maybe go this way, maybe that way. But essentially you should just keep moving forward. So that's kind of how I felt. And um, I guess about 18 months ago, I shifted my focus to cryptocurrency with my partner Amanda here. And uh, we've collaborated on a couple projects. And to me, cryptocurrency is, is just part of this uh, progression for myself about like self ownership. And I think it's very empowering to the individual. It's a peaceful way to divest yourself from regimes and policies you don't agree with. And uh, it's, it's very exciting to see. So, um, and I guess during this time too, I became like more introspective before I was sort of like, I have to like share these ideas and, and everyone has to be saved. And then I was like, well, what really can I do? And like many of the other speakers, you've heard Derek Rose and others about like focusing on yourself, like introspection. You know, I started listening to like Alan Watts and some of these other other thinkers. Um, and I kind of, I don't know, felt from different experiences and that like, you know, everything's connected, sort of we're all uh, one in a, in a way, but it's like an individualistic thing. I don't know if um, Ralph Waldo Emerson dubbed it the oversoul, but regardless of that, my thoughts or, or your thoughts on that, I just, I just think uh, like Albert J. Knox quote sums this up nicely about uh, the way to improve society. The only sure way to do it is to present it with one improved unit yourself. So my, that's really the thrust of my argument of my, my conversation today is just to um, continue to try to improve yourself and uh, you know, I think, I think uh, Derek said something about, you know, you can create content online that could be great, but if in person you're a dick, like that's not so good. But so essentially just try to be an ambassador and live what you think and uh, create the, the better world that way. And, um, you know, again, ideas have consequences. We act based on our ideas, our world perceptions based on our ideas. Language is integrally important to this. So I'd encourage you to consider what kind of language you're using. I know when I was involved with Cop Lock or some writers for Cop Lock would use, the authorities did this, and I'm like, hey, you're like granting them legitimacy. This is what they need to continue to do these, have these double standards. If, if even people who see their violence call them authorities, then it's not gonna cause the folks who not yet seen as institutional violence to realize, you know, kind of what's going on. So words like, the authorities or some folks, you know, in our, uh, I don't know, I guess I'm guilty of it in the past too, like calling folks like sheep, like they're unthinking, but that sort of like discounts them and says like they'll never be thinking. So maybe, I, you, should, you know, I would just encourage you to think about what you're using. Uh, even the word like revolution, I hear people throw that revolution around like, hey, we need a, it's a good thing and whether, whatever shape it takes, whether it's like peaceful or violent, whatever, but all the revolution is, it, it's a it's a movement around a certain a, a hub of authority, so it's not it's not any sort of progress. It's just replacing a king with a, another sort of tyranny, and it always has this hub, this central hub of authority from the top down. So I would encourage you, to, you know, maybe instead of revolution, you say evolution. We can move past this, where certain groups of people claim the legitimacy to control each other, things like that. That's really all I wanted to share today, and uh, I don't know how much time we have, but if anyone has any thoughts or questions, I'm happy to share.
Did I get any pushback from anyone make, be calling when my nickname was White Power Pete? And have I seen the movie Romper Stomper? I've not seen that movie. Um, and as for pushback, uh, not really. I mean, certainly my folks like questioned, like, why did you get into those ideas? We never, you know, like talk to you like that. And and I, and I don't know. I mean, I had some friends that were sort of into them, but I just, I guess, I just took it and I and I ran with it. And I, I really, I didn't really experience it. Like in school though, I felt like I got along with a lot of folks and it was just uh, not a consistent, uh, I don't know, worldview with my reality. So I really didn't have any overt pushback, but at the same time I didn't like uh, go out and say, I'm, this is my nickname. And like I said, my, my next transition to nationalism I thought was more like tolerated by people around me. And it was certainly one that, you know, I didn't get like a tattoo of some racist emblem on me, but I got this USSA flag, which is now, by the way, covered up with an anarchy sign. That's my journey. Uh, but uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Changing the old ways of old things. Do you see that 
Yeah, so the question is, could young people getting into the police apparatus change it? Um, I don't, I mean, it's just a, a degree, I guess, if, this, if the foundation is still this double standard, like we have a right to steal your money to then protect you, like that, that doesn't make sense. So um, I've heard like older police employees say, oh, this new generation of cops is like so gung-ho, former military, like they're just out there and like busting heads and stuff. But I don't know, I mean, I don't know, I think this is gonna be something that we see um, just their continued, uh, just police employee, the incentive, uh, the incentive in the police apparatus is to, to cage more people, to steal more stuff, and to grow in size and scope. That's what Monopoly is trying to do. And so that's at the direct inverse relation to our rights. And so as more people become negatively affected by police employees, there are more people are gonna wake up to this apparatus more people are going to try to find ways not to fund them, to not to pay the ransoms, and at the same time, market responses like cell phone one, civil society type organizations, self defense. You know, we'll, we'll we'll sort of build this alternative as this other old legacy shell is crumbling and and whatnot. Is that? Okay.